When someone tells you to take a hike, remember, they're really telling you to stumble upon horrifying creatures, creeps, and entities in the woods. Because that's what's going to happen when you go hiking in the wilderness. If you go, go prepared. Enjoy these allegedly true and scary hiking stories. Send me your stories at darkstories.org so I can narrate them. I want to hear some scary stories from Redwood National Forest. And I've got some good news. Freaky Folklore is now the sixth most popular society and culture podcast in America on Spotify. Thank you all so much. Here's the comment of the day from my previous video, Scary Cabin Stories. A viewer named Chris Bullard comments, Before you go into the woods, remember, people in sleeping bags are the burritos of the bear world. My reply? That's one of those things you laugh at, at first, then become disturbed at the actual idea of what it means. In this case, a grizzly bear is going to be using some hot salsa packets on you. Now, let's begin. There's something wrong with the deer in the Ozarks. From Unknown Hiker I've been hiking the Ozarks for years now. I'm a 34-year-old guy, kind of obsessed with my health and fitness. It started as an insecurity I had in high school. After all, I'd been an overweight teen. Feeling motivated and living in the country, I began hiking and camping with my dad. In a year's time, I'd lost the weight I wanted to lose, but I couldn't stop myself from spending most of my time outdoors after that. Nothing beats it. I feel like I get a sort of high from hiking. A month after I turned 24, my dad passed away from cancer. I think that's when it really stuck with me. A hobby I was extremely passionate about turned into a lifestyle once dad was gone. It was the thing that had brought us closest, too. Anyway, I'm not here to write you a sob story or an autobiography. I'm here to tell you that there's something incredibly wrong with the deer in the Ozarks as of September 2021. The Ozarks is prime hunting ground, so the deer around here spook rather easily. They'll run off before you even catch sight or scent of them, but lately I've been walking up on them by accident. But then it got extremely weird. This happened when I went on a camping trip alone on September 5th. I'd packed up my campsite early that morning, and I got right back on the hiking trail. Not 30 minutes later, I nearly laid bricks in my pants when I suddenly looked up, and where there had been a clear trail before now stood a big buck. He was grunting and huffing and kicking up the dirt. Now, I assumed it somehow hadn't noticed me, so I tried to shoo it away by shouting at it. Oddly enough, the buck suddenly stopped moving, and it wouldn't budge. It wouldn't look in my direction. I tried again shouting even louder than before, but no matter what I did, I couldn't get the buck's attention at all. Now, this thing was built big, and it had an intimidating rack on it, but curiosity overwhelmed my smarter side. So I reached out and touched it. A stupid idea, I know. I kid you not, this buck once again did not budge as I flat out laid my palm on its side. My hand was just under its ribs where its abdomen was. At first, I was kind of amazed. How exciting to touch a wild deer, let alone a big trophy buck, up close like this but my excitement quickly died when I felt something underneath my hand. There was something underneath the deer's skin, something slithering around. It felt like, well, snakes. Whatever was going on in there, it felt like four or five inch wide snakes or worms, or something, writhing about in disgusting circles. Even I thought that the poor thing had worms for a second before realizing that I don't recall there being worms that big on this planet. Maybe his organs were tossing about somehow, I wondered. But that didn't make sense at all either. Yet, it was all I could come up with. The only thing that made sense was that its intestines were moving. But how and why? Then it hit me. 
What if this was a side effect of wasting disease or something else? I yanked my hand away from the buck so fast, regretting doing something as dumb as touching an animal acting strangely. It could be rabid or diseased, you idiot, I told myself. Quickly, I fumbled about my bag with my other hand and poured hand sanitizer on the hand that had touched the deer. After vigorously scrubbing my hand, I looked up. I'd looked away for maybe 20 or 30 seconds. I nearly screamed. The buck's face was inches from my own, his mouth wide open, and a deep, almost inaudible grumbling sound was coming from within his throat. The creature's breath smelled of decay and death. Inside its mouth were these tumor-like growths, and at the tops of them, the flesh had turned dark gray, nearly black. I then noticed the rest of the buck's body hadn't shifted. Instead, the buck's neck had bent to the side to place its face close to mine in an unnatural, almost painful way. I scrambled backward and picked myself up, the deer did not move or follow me. Holding my breath as if I could still smell that stench, I ran past the deer quickly, watching it as I moved up the trail. And even then, it didn't move. It never moved again for as long as I could still see it. For the next few hours, I walked. I passed what was supposed to be my second camping site for the weekend hike and instead headed toward the third and last of the campsites, despite how exhausted I was. The image of that deer, the sensation of the things in its gut, moving around like a ball of giant worms, the smell of its innards like it had long been rotting from the inside, these things haunted me, and I wanted to get as far from that deer before sleeping as possible. It took me a few more hours after passing the second campsite before I made it to the third. My legs were killing me, even with the several ten-minute breaks I'd taken on my way down here. Luckily, the remainder of the evening was peaceful. I ate some cliff bars, downed a little too much water, and watched the sunset. A half hour after it lowered completely from the sky, I slinked into my tent and basically collapsed into my sleeping bag. I have no idea how long I slept before my eyes shot open. The sound of approaching footsteps was apparent, even within the cacophony of cricket songs and wind through the trees. These were slow, heavy, but graceful steps on dirt and rock. The embers of my fire still glowed from my fire pit, and I was soon able to see a faint shadow cast on the tent walls as the nighttime invader walked between the tent and the embers. It was a deer, this time a doe. I watched her silhouette continue further into my campsite, closer to my tent. Her gait seemed weird right away. She didn't appear to be walking cautiously, Instead, she walked deliberately, if that makes sense. She placed her hoof ahead of herself and put her full weight into it without hesitation. Her head did not dart to the side. Her ears did not flinch or turn to examine her surroundings. She seemed robotic, as if she were moving automatically. Until she stopped. All four hooves were now planted firmly on the ground. She stopped moving completely then. I watched for a few minutes, figuring she would eventually move on. Nope. Just before I shouted at her to get her to leave, I saw the shadow of her head turn. But from my perspective, I could not tell if she had turned toward me or the opposite way. However, something told me I knew that answer already. My heart sank when I heard that deep, grumbling sound come again. The same thing I'd heard when that buck had opened its mouth. This time, it was louder. Was this doe infected too? With whatever that parasite or disease was. Perhaps she was further along with the infection than the buck had been. 
suddenly. A disgustingly heavy and wet sound thudded to the ground below the dough. I lay there in disbelief. There's no way I just heard that. What did she just throw up? Sounded like an entire organ came out of her. Deep in thought and bewilderment, it caught me off guard when only moments later, I felt something slither under my right arm. I jumped up, shouting a curse and looking down at the tent floor. There was, in fact, a large, worm-like bulge where my arm had been. Whatever it was, it slithered along under the tent floor until it popped out the other side and slithered away. Thank God it had been outside, blocked by my tent. I'm no idiot. I'm sure you're thinking exactly what I was thinking then. The things slithering around inside the deer's belly had come right out of her mouth and crawled towards me. I stayed up all night with that deer just outside, standing there like a rotting statue. A 34-year-old man too scared to face a sick deer and too scared to encounter whatever slimy and worm-like parasite had been infecting them. Eventually, though, sleep took hold. I woke up in a sitting position at the corner of my tent. The first beams of sunrise came glistening through the canopy. Slowly, I unzipped the tent flap. Just outside on the ground lay the doe. She was dead. I threw on my shoes and stepped carefully outside to take a closer look. Her body was stiff and straight-legged. Her eyes were gone, and her abdomen looked impossibly thin and empty, like her innards had been vacuumed away from the outside. Somehow, there were no fluids of any sort to be found on the ground. The doe had become a dry, flattened, empty corpse. I packed up my things, and I left quickly. I kept my tent in a separate trash bag that I'd brought. That slithering thing had touched it, so I was planning on burning my tent when I got home. The hike to the end of the trail was safe and easy. I wasn't as sore as I'd expected to be that morning from my extended hike the day prior. My truck started just fine, and no alien parasites or infected deer attacked me. I simply drove home. I called my mom when I got back to tell her about this crazy crap. I struggled to produce a fake laugh to help me cope with it. I haven't gone back to the Ozarks to hike. Nowadays I keep my camping and hiking activity away from that region. My drives to new trails are a bit more extensive, but it's worth it to stay safe. Lord knows what's going on with the deer and the Ozarks. It kept following us. From Stan M. This happened to me when I was in quarantine last year. I've actually had an experience with a cryptid or some creature before. It was June when this happened, and school just ended. I'm currently 17, and when this happened, I was 17. During late May and early June, we got all of our schoolwork done. And basically, if you didn't have anything left to complete, you didn't have to go to school. We all loved fishing. That was the only thing we were allowed to do, really. About at 6 a.m. every morning, six of my friends would get up. One of us would pick the other up, since we all lived in the same neighborhood. We would go to the same pond, which was pretty big, and we'd fish for trout and bass. It was great considering the fact that there was a bait shop two minutes from there. On the last day of school, we decided to go to a different spot. We all had this app called Fishbrain. We could look at different spots near us. We found one spot that looked really consistent for trout. There were apparently some different spots that looked very good for Rainbow Brook, and rarely some brown trout. It was a 30 minute drive, and we all decided to go to this area. My friend Lincoln picked us all up and we drove the 30 minutes. 
we had to hike a trail to get to the different spots, and the trail was about four miles long. We arrived at about 6.30. We unpacked and hiked up. I like to fly fish, so I brought my fly fish rod for small trout in shallow areas, and my reel rod for holes where some big trout are waiting to devour some prey. We went up, and after about 10 minutes, we arrived at the first spot. It could barely fit three people, so we went in groups of three. My two friends, Mac and Devin, and I went on our own, and my other three friends, Harry, Lincoln, and Connor, went on their own. At 12 o'clock, we would all meet back up at the beginning of the trail. They left, and we stayed at one spot, where there were a few rainbow trout swimming in the creek. It was perfect for fly fishing, so my friend went a few feet out where there was a hole with a big trout and a few sunnies. I kept getting hits on the top, but nothing in. About 20 minutes later, I heard something by me. Mac and Devin were screwing around trying to catch the rainbow trout. Thinking it was a deer, I kept fishing until it got louder. This time, Mac and Devin heard it and stopped talking. It didn't sound like something a deer would make. It sounded more like a bear. We decided to keep hiking on to a different spot. We had been walking for about five, maybe ten minutes, when Mac heard someone talking. We froze and we all heard it. Someone, or something, was quietly talking. It then got louder. Before long, I heard something mimicking my friend Harry's voice. Guys, come here. Lincoln hurt himself. We knew that wasn't Harry. It sounded too sketchy, too raspy, too fake. We called Harry's phone to see where he was. He answered. We then asked where they were. He said something that gave me chills in 70 degree weather. We're at a little hole 20 minutes from where you guys are. We caught a small mouth. What about you? I hung up and I looked at where we'd heard the voice. We then heard a low, raspy, angry growl. I was reminded of that one South Park scene where Randy Marsh goes, I'm so startled. We texted Harry that we're going up to him and not to move. We kept walking and about five minutes later we heard the voice again. This time it was my friend Connor's, or it was supposed to be. Guys, Harry twisted his ankle and he needs help. We knew that wasn't Connor, so we kept on walking. We met up with them and we told them what happened. We quickly left the mountain and we drove home. We talked about what it could have been, but we couldn't decide on a theory. If anyone has any idea, I'd love to hear it. Was it really a bird? From Vermilion. The New England area of the United States has a rich history. This isn't spoken about much, but the people here know that the woods here can feel unwelcoming. If anyone could offer any suggestions regarding what you're about to hear, I would appreciate it. This happened probably 10 years ago on a sunny afternoon. I was walking my dog on a rural road near my house that we had walked countless times before. I heard a strange bird call just a little ways into the woods. As I continued down the road, I heard this bird again and again, seemingly just out of sight. This frustrated me because I'd never heard this type of bird before, and I wanted to get a good look at it to identify it. No matter how hard I looked, how carefully I searched the trees or brush, I never saw any movement, even as the bird calls seemed to change location. I reached the bridge over a small stream and turned around to start the walk back to my house. There aren't any real houses on this section of road, just the foundations of a mill from 200 years ago and an abandoned house so old it had an outhouse. I could still hear that bird 
and the sounds came with a nearly infuriating regularity. At some point, I became so frustrated that I stepped off the road to try to find this bird. Every time I stepped a few feet further, the location of the noise moved a bit deeper into the woods. How was I not seeing this thing moving around? The world seemed to rush back into reality. It's like I fell out of a trance or something. I was thirty or so feet in the woods. Everything was eerily quiet. Why was I doing this? The only noise then was that strange bird call. How could a bird move maybe fifteen feet in seconds without giving away its location? My determination to see this bird was replaced with a kind of nauseous fear. My brain was screaming at my stupidity. I turned to walk back to the road as casually as possible. Then I continued on my way home. Those bird calls followed me until I was away from that old property. I tried to walk the dog down that road a few more times, but each time I would hear those bird calls. I would get this feeling like my guts were crawling. It sounds crazy, but it felt as if something was laughing at me. My dog never reacted negatively, so maybe it was all in my head. It's been long enough that while I can't describe the bird calls, something tells me I would recognize them instantly. I spent hours listening to random bird calls on YouTube, but I never found them. Ghost Lights of Utah From Alexandria I used to work for summer vacation resorts a few summers ago. I would hike, camp, and explore the wild land every time I could. I worked for the resort in Lake Powell, and I knew there were a lot of unexplored canyons and old ruins all around. On a late afternoon, after exploring many new beaches and giant waterholes going deep into the earth, I was driving back to the dorm housing. The resort provided for seasonal workers that didn't have a camper. Please note that Lake Powell is a desert location, so the landscape is vast and low brush all around. Some areas are for cattle and cowboys, and you can always tell where the cattle are being moved to. You can even watch the cowboys riding on top of their horses. As I'm on my way to the dorms, I look to the right side of me that was all brushland, and there were lights. They looked like campfire, but this time of year you can't have campfires. I pulled over, curious. These roads are dead at night, and there are no streetlights for miles. I killed the car and looked at the lights. I've always loved the stories told by Native Americans of the creatures of the desert, and I didn't feel any fear when looking at the lights. After all, I was just thinking they're campfires at the moment. As I watched the lights, I started to think I was looking at people like a creeper. But then, the lights moved. I stepped to the other side of the road to get a closer look. I noticed there were no voices, laughter, or noises that you would usually hear from a campsite. I was even more curious, but careful not to step into the desert. I looked closer and the lights were nowhere near the ground. They had to have been more than four feet off the ground. My mind started to think of the ghost light stories. Whatever you do, don't follow them, my inner voice told me. But my body began to move before I could stop it. Soon my shoes were filled with sand and brush as I hiked towards the light. It felt as if I wasn't in control of my body, but I was wide awake. The lights got closer but seemed to notice me. Somehow they turned around and headed into the desert. As I finally made it to the spot where I'd seen the lights, there was a warm and calming sensation and a lot of rubble around the clear spot in the desert. It seemed like a house used to be here. As I got to the middle of the clear area, my body stopped. The lights disappeared when I reached that spot, and as soon as they went out, the area around me went cold, and the wind picked up. It was cold with or without the wind, though. I know the desert gets cold at night, but it wasn't the same kind of cold. I felt watched, almost like I was intruding into someone's home. 
I looked around and saw a small path coming to the area and decided that would be my best way out. I took another look around due to feeling like someone was coming up on me. I noticed the lights coming back slowly, almost waiting for me to leave. I apologized for intruding on their resting spot and that I wouldn't come back unless they wanted me to. The lights disappeared and came back almost like a flash, but slower. I did not get a happy feeling from them, so I started to take the path back to my car. As soon as I got back into the car, there was a slap on my window, almost like something said, wait, and I looked back at the spot where the lights were. It looked like people around a campfire. I know there were no people in that area that I just came from. This time, I didn't get an unwelcome feeling, just a feeling of wanting to be left alone. I said a small prayer, and I left. The next day, I asked a few people to come with me back to the spot. All we found were remains of an old building and some pots. I felt the same feeling of not wanting to be bothered, as if we were intruding on this land. So we left, but as we started to walk, the wind picked up, and I could have sworn I heard the words, Thank you, in a whisper on the wind. I've had many interesting events while in Lake Powell over the years, many of them involving stories told by the Native Americans, so I never tested any questions I did have due to not wanting to become a story myself. Strange Voices on the Appalachian Trail My dad and I, I'll call him C for this story, were supposed to meet my nephew L and my brother N to go camping and hiking for the weekend out through a part of the Appalachian Trail just outside of Gatlinburg, Tennessee. The drive there was going to take us almost eight hours, so my dad and I decided to leave at around seven so we could get there with plenty of daylight to hike a good ways down the trail. For the record, when it comes to being somewhere on time, my dad is never the most reliable person. He's a great guy, but always has some kind of excuse for being super late, and he'll try to make you laugh it off, but gets defensive when you don't just laugh at his excuses for being late. I can't remember what his excuse was this time, as he pulled into my apartment complex at almost 10 a.m., blasting his horn multiple times, pretending I was the one that had held us up. I was livid. Nothing makes me more mad than someone honking their horn like an idiot instead of just walking up to the person's door to knock. The whole ride to where we were meeting N and L, I barely said two words to him, I was so angry. But he was just being goofy trying to make me less mad at him for being late, with not so much as a phone call prior. We stopped at a couple of rest areas to get road snacks, and when we got back in the car he'd always start smoking, which he knew I hated him smoking in the car, but dad does what dad wants whenever he wants other people be darned. At about noon, when we were supposed to meet up with N and L, they began texting me. I told them dad was super late picking me up, so we'd probably get there around 6. They were angry as well. The sky was starting to turn orange as we finally pulled into the parking lot, where we'd leave our cars. This particular part of the trail had an optional loop that we were going to take in order to get back to the cars after the trip was done. As soon as we stopped and got out of the car, it started to rain, a cold kind of misty rain. Not particularly bad, but annoying since we should have already been to the part on the trail where we could be camping for the night. Ann and Del were ripping on Dad so much that he took even longer getting his gear together. So by the time we actually started the hike, we had to use the headlamps we'd packed in order to even see anything under the foliage. For those of you that don't know, flashlights and headlamps don't do much good in the total darkness of a forest. They might increase your viewing range from right in front of you to about 20 feet out, if that. Add to that the pouring rain that began about an hour into the hike, and we could maybe see about 5 to 10 feet in front of us at any given time. We were all miserable, and in order to keep our spirits up, and the bears at bay, even the slightest bit, my brother N suggested that we start singing. We started singing a lot of oldies. 
I can't remember now what they even were, but we weren't singers, and it was not a pretty sound we were making. At one point, Ian tripped while we were crossing a creek in the dark and smashed an eye watch he had, which he'd gotten at some company retreat. That thing got smashed all to pieces. At this point, we were all just looking for somewhere to set up our hammocks for the night, so we could get some sleep. However, as we had all our food with us, we had to at least make it to one of the locations on the trail that had ropes to hoist your gear out of reach of bears, so we had to keep moving until we got to one of these. Finally, in almost total darkness, and what now had died down to a light drizzle again, we made it. I'd lost almost all track of time at this point, but I imagine it was somewhere around 12 a.m. to 1 a.m. We took out our hammocks and rain covers from our packs and hoisted the packs on the bear ropes. If that isn't the technical term for these ropes, that should tell you something about my experience level with hiking long term. This was the first time any of us except Inn had done this kind of thing before. We got set up on a small hill. There were several trees and we could all tie our hammocks up in a straight line. They would be a good ways off the trail in a small clearing too. Let me tell you, if you've never set up a hammock for sleeping in, a hill is not the place to do it. But it was what we had that night. After we got settled in, said goodnight, and got into our tents, I was dozing for a little while before I was abruptly awoken by a strange feeling of being watched. I tried not to think too much of it, as I'm a little on the paranoid side to begin with, so I just chalked it up to my current surroundings being a somewhat new experience for me. No one was awake. The animals were making their usual noises, so I thought everything was fine, and I tried going back to sleep. Just as I closed my eyes, I heard a strange female voice whisper in my ear. Come with me. The voice sounded very weird, almost ethereal, and it was saying my name. The voice sounded like it was right by my ear, like someone was leaned in really close to whisper a secret to me, but I felt no breath in my ear. I immediately turned on my headlamp, which I'd worn to sleep, and I looked around. Nothing and no one was anywhere in sight, and I no longer heard the noises of the forest. I did not get out of my hammock, not that I was naive enough to think it offered any real protection from anything. I drew my knife and sat up for a while with it across my chest. The voice came several more times. Each time, nothing was there. The voice seemed to come out of nowhere and whisper directly into my ear every time. I heard no footsteps through the autumn leaves that were prevalent on the ground at this time, and I didn't even hear anything rustling in the branches of the trees or bushes either. Just that voice, calling my name calling me to come and join it. Every time the voice came, all the hair on my body stood on end. I was wide awake each time I heard it, and I was unable to fall asleep again until the sounds of the forest returned. I am not unaware that strange things exist in the world, and one of the few things I can think of that it might have been was a fey creature or being of some kind. My family, however, are all absolute non-believers in anything paranormal that isn't mentioned in the good book. However, after we had packed up and started walking, I had my brother N hang back with me for a second, and I asked him if he had heard anything strange last night. He was visibly pale, but remained silent. The worst part was that we still had two more nights that we would be out there. Luckily, the second day we got a much earlier start, Again, no thanks to my dad. We headed out and found a place where we could circle our hammocks in a group that night. And luckily, the voice did not return. Nor the next night. And we just had a hard hike ahead of us to get back to the cars. This is one of the strangest, and as long as I have anything to say about it, only overnight hiking experiences of my life. To top off this episode... Here are a few old and creepy stories from previous episodes that fit today's topic. Warning, the following story contains disturbing depictions of animal violence. 
There's something in the woods in regional New South Wales from Hunter 89. Around 2012, my best friend and I were hiking through the woods of one of the local mountains late in the afternoon for some exercise and because we were bored as can be. Not much happened on the way up. A few kangaroos here and there, but not much else. Great view at the top, good chill spot too. So after the sun went down, we got the flashlights and headlamps out, carefully making our way down the mountain towards town. Again, not a lot happened along the way back, aside from some odd noises, some excitable ruse and other wildlife. About three fourths of the way down, we stopped for a bit to rest, which in itself was odd as we weren't all that tired out heading up the mountain, and we'd had plenty of rest at the summit. We both felt pretty drained though, but since our backpacks were lighter after consuming some of the supplies, it seemed a bit out of the ordinary. Then we noticed it. A dead silence up there, no nightlife, no nothing, no crickets, and even the roos weren't crashing about the area like they had been. Absolutely nothing. So we were understandably a bit weirded out and decided we should quietly pick up the pace. As we made it to the bottom, it was like the sound had been turned back on or something. So we continued on our way, feeling normal again, having a yak about random crap and moving aside for the rare car. About another kilometer or two later, we started hearing some weird stuff and we'd noticed that all the other sounds had once again stopped. This time, when I started to feel tired, my adrenaline started pumping instead because I remembered it had happened before. And then that sound happened again, some kind of rasping, throaty roar in the distance. It came from ahead and to the right of the road in the woods. Danged if I know what it was, but I do know that that sound isn't achievable by a human. As we got closer, we could hear a lot of crashing noises in the area we'd originally heard the sound from, followed by that horrible sound again, and the sound of an animal in agony being cut short. From when we first heard it, up until that point, we had turned off our lights and were practically creeping along the road, but now, Curiosity unfortunately got the better of us. We shone our torches over in the area those messed up sounds had been coming from. What we saw next nearly made me wimp out to the max, and if my best friend hadn't been there, I would have bolted back to town. However, despite our attempts to show the whole macho as always vibe, all we could do was ready our knives and stare uncomprehendingly at this thing that was staring right the heck back at us. To make matters pants-wreckingly worse, this gosh-danged thing had a dead, almost full-grown kangaroo in its mouth, or what was left of the roo, anyway. Since it seems like it was gutted alive and was still kinda twitching, Every instinct told me to run like a bat out of hell back to town, but thankfully, reason trumped my instincts, and I chose not to make any sudden moves, especially since I somehow knew that we wouldn't make it very far if either of us ran. For what felt like ages, it seemed to be watching us, as though deciding whether to drop its fresh kill in exchange for us or not but then it sort of hunched up and made a slightly muffled form of that sound it seemed to make, backing up a little and jumping over five meters up the darned cliff face behind it. It then made the noise again before jumping and climbing further up the cliff and out of sight. It was big with gray white hair or fur and it could stand on two legs when it needed to. It had freaky shaped but clearly powerful jaws and claws like darned hands. But worst of all were its eyes. I swear, those eyes, they looked like they were full of nothing more than hunger and hatred. Needless to say, I don't like going hiking at night anymore. 
Werewolf Sighting from the Mad Miller. In spring of last year, there have been reports from sheep farmers along the Dutch-German border, especially in the eastern Dutch provinces and way down in the southeast of the country. These shepherds have reported several cases of their sheep, and on some occasions even their sheepdogs, being slaughtered, but not eaten. These cases have been on the news several times, for if the killers would have been wolves like many suspected, they were displaying some off behavior. Namely, wolves don't just kill their prey and leave it behind, nor would they consider fighting one or several sheepdogs on a normal occasion. And lastly, they would never invade human territory, especially not on their own. Not to mention the territory was being guarded by dogs and electric fences in the meadows. Still, there have been reportings of sheep and sheepdogs being killed, and sometimes being partially eaten. In the southeast, there were 11 sheep, six of which were lambs, slaughtered, but left untouched beyond that. There was no trace found of the killer, save for the deep tooth marks in the torn throats of the dead sheep, as well as one paw print with a length of about seven inches. After those killings, there was a period of silence, until there came new reports of the killings in the east having been done by wolves. This was said to have been confirmed by DNA tests coming from the bite marks on the dead sheep. Roughly a year later, there is now a small pack of wolves living on the biggest Dutch national park, Belua, and there have been no more reports of sheep being killed, not in the news anyway. The killer of the 11 sheep in the southeast has also been confirmed to have been a wolf, but this was never supported by DNA results or further arguments other than young wolves that are looking for a territory to kill sheep on farms to show other wolves who's boss. But this contradicts the statement that wolves wouldn't dare to approach human settlements guarded by dogs and an electric fence. It was all quite suspicious. I loved going into the woods at nightfall, so much so that I've done it at least three times this year, though visiting a forest after sunset or before dawn is still illegal here. I would often take a short walk right before sunset and leave when it was almost completely dark, wearing dark clothes, so the foresters or creepy people would not spot me easily. I don't know why I'm addicted to hikes, especially nocturnal hikes in the woods. I felt a really strong call of the wild, if you'd call it that, ever since the first time I went off trail in the summer of 2017. When I go out to visit the woods, either going off trail or not, not even the time of day matters. I'm always energetic and excited about it. I would even dare to say that I wanted to go hunting on some occasions. I would feel the urge to hunt when I'd see a deer or rabbit run by but I have neither a license nor weapons, so I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be able to do any of that. A few weeks ago, as of writing this, at the start of autumn, I went for another night hike in the forest. I had to bring my flashlight since it was cloudy and rainy outside. As always, I went there on my mountain bike, chaining it to a pole before I'd set off into the darkness between the trees. I saw the last people walking back to their cars and homes, as I walked into the opposite direction. It had become completely dark when I made it to the middle of the forest. I silently enjoyed the cold, the scents and sounds of the woods, and I had nearly forgotten about my encounter in these same woods almost two years ago. After having set myself down on a wooden bench nearby, I heard the faint bleeding of sheep from about 200 meters away from me. I stood up and began to walk in the direction of the noise, mostly because the bleeding sounded rather distressed, as if the sheep were panicking and trying to flee from something. I was already surprised that I could hear it from that far away anyway, but what surprised me at least just as much was that I could smell the scent of the sheep as well. The wind was blowing in my direction, but still, I didn't know I was capable of this. 
I should mention it's quite normal to encounter a flock of sheep here in these woods, as local shepherds have their sheep stay in several places to control the weeds growing there. One day you might find them on the moor, and the other day you'd find them stationed near the bank of a lake. A low, fairly easily removable makeshift electric fence would hold the sheep from wandering off and losing the flock. Tonight, the flock had been placed on a small moor, about 200 meters from where I sat on a bench. It took me some time walking toward the pen before I could see the sheep, as the flock was hidden by bushes from my direction. Though what I saw when I arrived at the pen kind of shocked me, because not only were the animals running around frantically, trying to escape, but there were two slaughtered sheep lying in a small puddle of blood. I could see that their throats had been torn open by jaws that seemed bigger than those of a dog or even a wolf. There were no signs of the fence having been touched though. What I did notice were a scramble of enormous canine looking paw prints around the sheep's corpses and around the pen. As if the killer had carefully been walking around at first meticulously choosing its prey before stepping inside and making its move. The sight was, of course, shocking and terrifying, but weirdly enough, not for me. I wasn't as shocked and scared as I'd expected myself to be. Instead, I felt more frustrated. Frustrated about someone or something having been roaming around in my woods, causing a disturbance. I had begun to see these woods as my second home. As much of a reckless idiot as I was, I decided to follow the tracks. I was curious to see who or what was roaming the forest at night. If I wouldn't have known better, I would have realized that I might have just been walking into the jaws of death soon enough. I kept following the huge tracks until the trees surrounding me made the environment hard to see. I changed my mind as I could no longer see much at this point, the trees blocking out pretty much every possible light entering my eyes. So I whipped out my flashlight and shone it around, while I could still hear the sheep panicking in the distance, just maybe 55 meters behind me. I was suddenly on edge again when a new scent hit my nose, a scent which seemed to be a mix of wet dog and fresh blood. This would soon be accompanied by footsteps on the forest floor, calm steps, as if something was walking up to me to check me out. I directed my flashlight toward where the scent and sound was coming from, and what I saw first were eyes, gold yellow eyes, about four feet above the ground. Now this already meant that whatever it was was bigger than a dog, bigger than a wolf even. I froze as the beast stepped closer, and at this moment I could make out its face and front view of its body. It was similar to a wolf, though in proportion slightly bigger and sturdier. Its fur was dark on its back and lighter on its belly. It even seemed to have a short, dark mane on its neck. The animal appeared to be staring at me cautiously, but it didn't seem to be aggressive yet. From the blood on its snout, I could tell that it must have been the beast that killed those sheep. And now, I was indeed scared. Any sudden moves or panic that I could not control could mean the death of me. It wasn't like I stood much of a chance against a beast this big. Still showing no aggression, the creature came closer until it stood about five meters away from me. Then, as I stood there watching in utter awe and silence, the creature stood up on two legs, like a bear, now towering over me at about seven feet in height. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, and I took a more sturdy, defensive stance. I had to constantly remind myself not to show fear, it leaned forward a little and sniffed the air to smell my scent. It then perked its ears up, 
seemingly more suspicious of me. All I knew was that the bigger you appear to certain creatures, the less likely you are to be attacked. But no matter what I did, this thing would be looking down on me. Still, I tried to make the best of the situation, trying not to look intrigued or scared. This, as if by some miracle, seemed to work. The wolf-like thing stepped backward slightly, breaking eye contact with me. I took a tiny step forward and tried to look defensive or territorial. As I appeared to have the upper hand now, I did something ballsy. I spoke to it, trying to sound fearsome and demanding. My woods. Get out. Again, I was genuinely surprised that this happened to work. The beast turned its head away from me and growled softly, what seemed to sound like a protest. It then went down on all fours and turned around to disappear into the darkness. Before it completely vanished from sight, it gave me one last awfully human-looking glance, its eyes reflecting the beam of my flashlight. As soon as I could no longer see, hear, or smell the wolf, I let out a sigh of relief, so loud that I was afraid the wolf would still hear me and that it would come back. Only then did I start shivering, my mind and body at once realizing I had just survived a life-or-death encounter with an animal beyond the normal, something that reminded me an awful lot of a werewolf. Cold shivers poured down my spine, and I grew a little nauseous when I was suddenly startled by a piercing but distant howl coming from behind me. It was both beautiful and haunting, reminding me of the howl from a game I used to play called The Hunter Classic. The sound chilled me to the bone, and all I wanted then was to get the heck out of those woods, back to my home. After about 20 minutes of speed walking back to my bike and continuously looking around me and pausing, cautiously peering into the darkness at every sound I heard, I made it back to my bike. Quickly, I unlocked it and raced home. Back at home, the realization hit me again. I might as well have been as dead and torn up as one of those sheep. When I calmed down, the questions started coming in too. Why didn't it attack me? Why did it react like that when it sniffed me? What's also strange is I haven't heard anything in the news, even the local news, about the slaughtered sheep I discovered. It's as if it never happened, with perhaps even the shepherd completely denying that his flock lost two of its members to a supernatural predator. All I know is that I won't be telling anybody in my family or friend group about my experience. If it comes up in the news, I'm sure people will just think it's a wolf, just like it happened with all the other sheep killings in the Netherlands over the past two years. And I'll be quitting my nocturnal walks in the woods for sure. Because next time I encounter something like that, I may not be so lucky. Lights in Coconino National Forest from ATL Hoodrat. My husband and I moved into our camper van back in October, and our first stop was to visit family in West Texas, then move on to Arizona for a music festival. After the festival ended, we decided to hang around Tucson for a bit and see the gym and mineral show before heading north to Flagstaff then to the Grand Canyon. While heading to the Grand Canyon, we found an awesome boondocking spot in the Coconino National Forest. It was on this small forest service road that only had two spots on it, and one was occupied by a man and his young son, who I assumed were spending the day in Sedona, about 45 minutes away, and retiring early to their RV. We snagged the last spot before crossing, which was awesome. It was perched up on this hill that had been leveled at the top. 
You could see all the mountain ranges surrounding you with the ranch fence next to us. The ranch was over the next mountain in the valley. There were wild cattle around, and the landscape was absolutely breathtaking. I spent most of my day just staring out at it. It's an extremely remote place as well, which we love, because we love stargazing and privacy. We go to bed early most evenings, around sunset, waking up around sunrise with a middle-of-the-night bathroom break. We woke up and walked outside for our bathroom break, and could not believe the stars. They looked wonderful. We went back to bed and agreed to stay another night, just to see the stars again, even better. The following day, we spent listening to music and rock hounding and taking in the landscape. I kept looking at this one particular ridge, telling my husband that a bright light was shining on it, almost like a strobe. He looked and it was gone. It wasn't something I thought of until I saw it a few times again, and then I became concerned. As a wilderness first responder, maybe there was a hiker out there who was stranded on the ridge, trying to get our attention. But the areas that the light came from changed, much too often for someone to be traveling by foot or bike. Later that evening, after we made dinner, we sat outside watching the sunset and decided to go back in the van to hang out while it got dark out. Then it would be dark enough to really see all the stars and the Milky Way. It was around 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. We came out and I immediately looked up. There was this light that was so bright white and it seemed close. I asked if that was the North Star and if so, how could it be so bright and close to us? My husband said he wasn't sure. We kept walking around our site looking at the sky and the satellites. We went around the van then back to our original spot and looked up. Immediately, we noticed the light was gone. But then we began to notice the light again. It was moving further away. It was a different color now, too. It was moving rapidly. It would jump around almost like a hummingbird, but changing color between yellow, red, and blue. I've seen a lot of different phenomena in my life, so I wasn't particularly worried or shocked especially since we had just seen the Marfa lights, which looked similar, but with more flowing movements. That all changed in the next few moments, when the light began to change colors into monochromatic ranges of deep violet and violet blues with magenta. It was almost peaceful looking, soothing. It started moving closer to us, changing colors more often. Blues, violets, pinks, greens, it came down to the ground level on the other side of the large juniper. I lost my breath at that point. The juniper was only a short distance from us, and at this point we noticed that it was literally peeking at us from around the juniper, just as we had been peeking at it from around our van. It moved so much, like, I guess the way to describe it, it was like a curious child, and it seemed like the light would have been where the face was, and as tall as an average male. All of a sudden, I realized how close we were to seeing it, and I became afraid. Because I don't think I was ready to see it. It's like a big question that's about to be revealed, and are you sure you want to know the answer? You can't go back. The box would be open. I may have made a noise or jumped back when the fear set in, and this... Light, thing, did not like this. It got very low to the ground, almost cat-like, and was looking through the bushes. Immediately, it began to pulsate red, the color of aggression. It scared the heck out of me, to be honest. We ran back to the van, jumping in and locking the doors. Our van has this bubble wrap mylar insulation in the windows, which we put up in the winter months to keep in the warmth so we couldn't see out of them. At that point, I didn't want to. I was horrified. I couldn't catch my breath. After we finally calmed down, we decided we needed to look. What person wouldn't? We got out to inspect. 
where the light had been before now seemed empty. This was a relief, but it also made me wonder if I was making the whole thing up. Then I looked to my left, just beyond the fence to the ranch. I noticed several of the same type of lights moving back and forth in greens and blues. They were pretty far away, so I wasn't so worried, and I felt a bit more calm about the situation. They were far away enough. For some reason, I turned towards the ridge I'd been looking at earlier that morning. I thought I saw something larger moving in the dark. Of course, I told myself that I was just crazy, to disregard it. And at that moment, a bright light came on. But it wasn't a light. It was a creature of some sort, very similar to something you would imagine from movies that depict alien beings as robots or wear robotic machines. This machine was large and clearly visible. It was shining a light into the valley where we had just seen the blue and green lights. It flashed a couple of times and then was gone. All the other lights were gone shortly after that and did not come back that night. I wish we had thought to grab our phones, but the first one happened so rapidly that it didn't at all occur to us to record it. Though there was quite a bit of strangeness in the photos I had taken during the trip. 